Our topic is distributism and the ownership economy. Distributism is a traditional conservative approach to political economy that is rooted in the Christian tradition. In particular, it is based in the social teachings of the Roman Catholic Church, and it looks to medieval times as an era that was much better than our own in a lot of ways. Uh, distributism is, as I said, rooted in Christian conservatism and in biblical tradition, uh, but there is no need to actually be a believer in Christianity in order uh, to agree that distributism is the right approach to political economy. In modern America, the Overton window has shifted so far to the right that distributism sounds like socialism to most people. However, Distributism is actually the exact opposite of socialism. It is the antithesis of socialism. Socialism proposes to abolish private property, have government take over all industry, uh, and have the economy centrally planned by government bureaucrats. Socialism replaces private property with government ownership and replaces markets with government planning. Government decides what to produce and how much of it to produce, how resources ought to be allocated within the economy, and how uh, the wealth uh, produced by production ought to be distributed throughout the economy. Distributism is the opposite of socialism in every way. Rather than the abolition of private property, distributism proposes the universalization of private ownership. The distributist wants everyone, or nearly everyone, to either own a small business for themselves or else to have a share of ownership in some cooperative enterprise. Distributism rejects central planning in favor of what John Madai calls a truly free market, not a laissez-faire system, but a fair system that more closely approximates the ideal of pure competition. What distributism advocates is an ownership economy. The term distributism was coined by G.K. Chesterton and Hilaire Belloc to describe their own views. However, the ideals espoused by Chesterton and Belloc are fundamentally identical to the ideals of American founding fathers like Thomas Jefferson. Like Jefferson, the distributists hold that widespread distribution of private ownership throughout society is the way to go. It is important to note also that Chesterton and Belloc believe distributism to follow from the social teachings of the Catholic Church. Some people may object to me classifying distributism as the opposite of socialism. Isn't capitalism the opposite of socialism? Well, no. Capitalism and socialism are really two sides of the same coin, while distributism is the negation of the coin altogether. To clarify what I mean here, let's look at some definitions. What is capitalism? Capitalism is a system of rule by capitalists. Capitalism is a system that is dominated by the owners of capital, just as feudalism was a system dominated by feudal lords. The primary characteristic of capitalism is that capital and land is concentrated into the hands of an elite few at the top, while the majority of the populace is deprived of any significant share in the ownership of land and capital. And this means that the vast majority of people must subject themselves to wage slavery in order to survive. Most people within a capitalist society are not capitalists, but rather are proletarians or wage workers. G.K. Chesterton once said, The problem with capitalism is not too many capitalists, but too few capitalists. Capitalism, in the sense that we are using the term here, does not mean free markets, and it does not mean private ownership of industry. We are concerned here with what can be called actually existing capitalism, capitalism as it actually exists in the real world. While private ownership of industry and the market system are necessary components of capitalism, they are not its only components. A society cannot be capitalist without a market system and private ownership, but a system can have both uh, private ownership and markets and still not be capitalist. This is the case with systems such as feudalism, mercantilism, mutualism, and distributism. What is socialism? As I've already said, socialism is government ownership of the means of production, where central planners decide how to allocate resources and distribute the rewards of labor. Socialism is a reactionary movement. It is a rebellion against capitalism. 
Rather than seeing the distribution of private ownership as the problem, socialism sees private ownership itself as the problem. So it responds by demanding the abolition of private property. Now, distributism sees itself as a third way, beyond capitalism and socialism. Uh, dis distributists don't want capitalism. They don't want all the wealth and resources to be hoarded by a few people at the top, while the rest of the populace is forced of necessity to sell their time and labor to that elect few who happen to own everything. They also don't want government to take over ownership of all enterprise. They don't want uh, big government. So, as an alternative to capitalism, where most wealth and resources are owned by a few private individuals, and socialism, where most wealth and resources are owned by the state, we have the third way of distributism, where ownership of wealth and resources is widely distributed throughout society, such that the majority of people are capitalists in some sense. Under distributism, you could be a farmer or an owner of a small business, or if you work in a manufacturing facility, you could be a part owner of that enterprise. But the goal is the most widespread distribution of ownership that is possible. Distributism, being a third way beyond capitalism and socialism, presents a critique of both capitalism and socialism, seeing itself as an alternative to both. According to distributists, capitalism is just feudalism repackaged. Historically, you had the commons. Most land was not privately owned, but was considered a commons. Uh, land was often communally farmed, and unused land uh, was free for anyone to use. The system of property was use of fructuary rather than allodial or fee simple. With use of fructuary property, ownership is linked to occupancy and use rather than uh, being conferred by a uh, formal uh, legal document like a title. If there was an unused piece of land and you built a house on it, uh, your use of the land made it your property. Uh, when you abandon the space, it would lapse back into the commons and would be free for anyone else to come along and claim as their own. This ancient system of property was not based upon titles and deeds, uh, legal documents issued by the government. It was, uh, in a way, far more libertarian. Government had far less of a role in the market because property was a matter of fact based upon, based upon occupancy and use rather than a matter of government decree. This old medievalist system collapsed with the emergence of feudalism. Government came in and seized ownership of the commons. Land that was communally farmed or used by churches and monasteries was confiscated by the government. This process of government seizing the commons is known as the enclosures. After the enclosures, the government issued land titles and gave those titles to people that they favored. It was especially common for land to be given to military leaders. This process created a class of oligarchs known as lords or landlords. The lords began to charge people rent for the use of the land. Now, previously, Everyone had been able to farm the land in common without having to pay tribute to anybody. But now, even though nothing really changed in nature, the government arbitrarily gave legal ownership to private individuals who neither occupied nor used the land. These private individuals were now able to charge the common folks rent for the privilege of using the land. The farmers who had always been farming the land continued to farm the land, but now they suddenly had to pay rent to the lords in order to continue doing what they had always had the right to do. The lords no longer had to work for a living, but could just live off the rent payments. The, uh, the lords could effectively leverage their ownership of land in order to demand rent from the serfs. The rent here was nothing more than tribute or a tax imposed by private individuals uh, whom legal privilege had suddenly turned into little monarchs. This new system was called feudalism. Feudalism laid the foundation for capitalism. Now you had a class of people, the feudal lords, who were basically idle. They weren't doing anything. They weren't working the land. They weren't producing anything of value. They weren't contributing anything. Uh, 
yet they were still accumulating wealth. They were collecting payments from the tenants. They were demanding tribute from the people living on the land and farming the land. This feudal system allowed non-productive feudal lords to confiscate a large share of the wealth produced by labor without actually having to do any labor themselves. These non-productive landlords were collecting rent payments and accumulating that as capital. Non-productive landlords accumulated large stocks of capital by exploiting all those individuals who actually produced things through their own labor. And this is what laid the foundation for capitalism. This accumulation of capital is what allowed for the Industrial Revolution. Since certain individuals had large stocks of money at their disposal, they could afford to take on large industrial pursuits in the hopes of earning even more money. The problem is that this accumulated capital was accumulated through unjust means. That stock of money was created by government arbitrarily granting special pr legal privileges to one group of people at the expense of everyone else. With the emergence of capitalism, the feudal lord morphed into the industrial capitalist. Under the new industrial arrangement, many people had to cooperate and work together in order to produce things, but the bulk of the wealth produced by this cooperative labor was pocketed by the capitalists in the form of profits. Under this new system of capitalism, most people are deprived of any significant share of ownership in the land and wealth of the nation, which means that they have no way of surviving other than selling their time and labor to a capitalist in exchange for wages that are usually not equivalent to the amount of wealth their labor has actually produced. The working class, now the majority of the populace, has no independence. They have no self-sufficiency. Uh, they have to rely on the generosity of the capitalists in order to survive. If they cannot find a capitalist that is generous enough to offer decent wages, then they are damned to poverty and starvation. So, under feudalism, large masses of people were deprived of their land. With the Industrial Revolution, they were no longer needed for agricultural purposes. Uh, not being able to rely on farming and agriculture anymore, the dispossessed masses were thrust out, pushed out into the wage labor market, and forced to move into the cities to look for jobs in manufacturing. The majority of the population ended up becoming wage slaves. Even today, wage slavery is the norm. The average person has no alternative means of survival besides wage labor. Most people don't have access to the resources needed to go into business for themselves or to live off the land. Proponents of distributism have referred to their vision as a truly free market. In Everybody's Business by Abel Lerner, Lerner talks about the democracy of the market and how markets allow one to vote with their money. If you don't support the practices of a particular industry or business, you can vote with your dollars by sending your money elsewhere. However, this democracy of the marketplace really only works when everybody has a relatively equal share of wealth. If some individuals have billions of dollars and other individuals have no money at all, the market becomes undemocratic. In order to ensure that the democracy of the marketplace actually works, you need a more egalitarian distribution of wealth. Thus, government ought to pursue distributist policies that ensure that excesses of wealth and poverty are eliminated. Nevertheless, distributists are not egalitarian extremists or radical Jacobins hell-bent on eliminating all inequality. If one individual chooses to work harder or longer than others, then it is only fair that they make more money than others. The distributist is truly concerned about equality of opportunity rather than equality of outcome. It's more important to ensure that everyone has the opportunity to earn as much as the top earners in society than it is to ensure that everyone does earn the same amount. If we want what distributists like John Madai have called a truly free market, we need widespread distribution of wealth and resources. Any economy in which wealth and resources are mostly concentrated into the hands of an elite few will not function as beautifully as the theoretical free market with pure competition envisioned by classical liberals and libertarians. In order to have a truly free market like that, we need rules, regulations, and policies that ensure a fair and wide distribution of ownership. We need an ownership economy.
The most convincing arguments for a free market are based on a theoretical analysis of pure competition. The market is most beneficial and efficient when pure competition prevails and people have a multitude of choices with regards to whose product to buy and where to buy it from. Under pure competition, the market tends to provide the highest quality product at the lowest possible price uh, because companies must compete for your business. However, capitalism tends to destroy pure competition. Under laissez-faire, you tend to end up with fewer choices, not more. As companies compete in the unregulated market, cutthroat competition encourages companies to undercut the prices of their competitors. Each competitor is motivated to do their best to outdo their competitors until the competition is put out of business. Inevitably, many competitors end up going out of business. Unregulated markets, then, uh, tend to result in fewer choices as the number of competitors decreases over time. Pure competition, the ideal of the free market economists, uh, doesn't exist under unregulated capitalism. Most of the competitors uh, get put out of business, leading to a condition of monopoly or oligopoly where one business or a few businesses corner the whole market. Without pure competition, the monopolists and oligopolists can jack up prices and offer shitty products and services. People will still pay for their goods and services because there is no alternative, and society is a whole lot uh, worse off as a result. Meanwhile, in the process of becoming monopolists and oligopolists, the companies that remain accumulated ridiculous amounts of wealth uh, that they can now leverage to put would-be competitors uh, out of business before they can even get off the ground. When a small local competitor starts up, Walmart can afford to sell its product at a loss just long enough to put the competitor out of business. No individual or small business can compete with Walmart or Amazon. Consequently, if we want a truly free market, we need government to impose rules and regulations that help maintain market conditions that are closer to the ideal of pure competition. We need government to implement policies that ensure a widespread distribution of wealth, as well as to ensure that there are sufficient options and choices available in the marketplace. We need sufficient choices available on the market in order to allow individuals to boycott bad businesses and to utilize the democracy of the marketplace to vote with their dollars and take their business elsewhere if they don't like the practices of a certain business. Otherwise, markets are simply no good and might as well be given up on. Distributists have a principle known as subsidiarity. Wikipedia gives the following definition. Subsidiarity is a principle of social organization that holds that social and political issues uh, should be dealt with at the most immediate or local level that is consistent with their resolution. End quote. And again, another Wikipedia page says, Subsidiarity is an organizing principle that matters ought to be handled by the smallest, lowest, or least centralized competent authority. Political decisions uh, should be taken at a local level if possible, rather than by a central authority." End quote. This principle of subsidiarity is part of Catholic social teachings. Pope Pius XI summarizes this principle as follows in his papal encyclical Quadragesimo Anno. Just as it is gravely wrong to take from individuals what they can accomplish by their own initiative and industry and give it to the community, so also it is injustice uh, and at the same time a grave evil and disturbance of right order, to assign to a greater and higher association what lesser and subordinate organizations can do. Uh, for every social activity ought of its very nature to furnish help to the members of the body social and never destroy and absorb them." End quote. It's important to note that subsidiarity is not anti-centralization per se. If some necessary or extremely desirable thing can only effectively be achieved through larger, more centralized organization, then subsidiarity dictates that it ought to be done on a larger and more centralized basis. The term subsidiarity comes from the Latin subsidium, which literally means to sit behind. This was a Roman military term 
that referred to the practice of larger, more powerful units sitting behind smaller units ready to lend support if needed. The term subsidiarity, then, when applied to organization in general, means that larger and more powerful uh, levels of organization and government ought to sit back and let smaller, more immediate levels of organization uh, take care of things. Uh, but also that the larger and more powerful uh, unit ought to be ready to lend support uh, to the more local level if needed. And this principle of subsidiarity is to be applied not just to government, but also to businesses, charities, churches, and any other form of organization that you can imagine. Production and distribution ought to be done uh, by the smallest and least centralized form of organization capable of effectively carrying out the task. This means that small businesses are, are to be preferred to large corporations uh, most of the time. However, certain tasks uh, must be done on a more centralized basis. Also, uh, we would generally like to see competition in the marketplace. Nevertheless, certain types of services tend to become natural monopolies. Utility services, garbage collection, sewage, policing, and national defense uh, tend to be most effectively done on a monopolistic basis. Yet monopolies tend to provide the worst service at the highest possible price. Monopoly is the negation of pure competition. Distributists hold that when monopoly is unavoidable, it is best for government to own and operate the monopoly. We want the public interest, rather uh, than the maximization of profits, to be the guiding principle of all monopolies. But the principle of subsidiarity holds that such government-owned monopolies ought to be run by the smallest, most local, and least intrusive level of government capable of effectively taking on the task. Utility and sewage services ought to be municipally owned, while the military ought to be nationally owned. And if there is any sort of disaster or crisis with local monopolies, such as the Flint water crisis, uh, the distributist principle of subsidiarity requires uh, that state or national government intervene in order to help fix the problem, assuming that the local government can't fix the problem on its own. The idea of subsidiarity has been the impetus behind uh, modern uh, confederalist and decentralist ideologies. Individuals like Leopold Kor, E.F. Schumacher, Kirk Kirkpatrick Sale, and Wilhelm Rapke have been influenced by this idea of subsidiarity. The application of this principle has led to the emergence of the Small is Beautiful movement and the push for a humane economy on a human scale. Distributists see feudalism and capitalism both as being inherently unjust, but they reject the socialist alternative too. Instead, they offer several solutions whereby government could use things such as tax policy in order to achieve distributive justice and ensure a more fair and widespread distribution of ownership of both land and resources. A proposal put forth by Hilaire Belloc is the implementation of a progressive tax, or what he calls a differential tax. Belloc writes, and I quote, The principle of the differential tax is that a different proportion of taxation, as well as a different amount, may be applied to men in different circumstances. For instance, if you apply an income tax of zero to incomes under $2,000, or 5% uh, between $2,000 and $5,000, uh, or 10% uh, between $5,000 and so on, this is a differential tax. Or again, if you charge an amount of $5 for taking out one license for a particular purpose, $15 for taking out two licenses, $50 for taking out three, and so on, you are applying a differential tax to licenses. The ways in which differential tax can be used to reestablish private property in the mass of men are various, according to the form of evil attacked. One obvious and primary way is to establish a differential tax upon the passage of property by sale. Make it easier for the poor man to buy and the rich man to sell. Such a principle, applied to agricultural land, has already had excellent effects on certain parts of Europe, uh, where the soil had fallen into few hands. When large property buys up small, let the tax be heavy. 
when large property buys fragments of large uh, when small property buys fragments of large property and so helps to divide up property, let the tax be light and at last non-existent. End quote. Distributists have also proposed extending the idea of a differential tax to corporations. Distributors prefer small local businesses to large national and international corporations. An economy with a lot of small, individual-owned or family-owned businesses is going to be an economy with more widespread distribution of property, whereas an economy with large corporations is likely to be an economy with less widespread distribution of ownership. In order to produce the ownership society that distributists envision, they propose applying a differential tax on the expansion of companies and enterprises. If you have a small business with one location, uh, you would pay no tax at all. When you open your fifth location, the government imposes a small tax. The tax on expanding your business uh, would gradually get larger the further you expand. At some point, the tax would, would actually prohibit further expansion. This would ensure that no business would get too large. Instead, you'd have a lot of smaller competing companies rather than a few large companies dominating the market. This would help establish a scenario uh, that more closely resembles the ideal of pure competition envisioned by proponents of libertarianism and classical liberalism. In many ways, distributism is more libertarian than libertarianism itself. Under distributism, you would have a system of differential taxation in place uh, that would make it impossible for one corporation to grow so large as to dominate the whole economy. Right now, Walmart and Amazon dominate the economy. There are no more local mom-and-pop shops uh, because small businesses can't compete with Walmart and Amazon. Differential taxes could also be used to keep banks and financial institutions from becoming too big to fail. You could also subsidize small and local businesses by offering them tax breaks. You could tax large businesses at a higher rate than small businesses. As such a tax in itself would serve as a sort of subsidy by making it easier for the smaller business to compete against the larger business. And this uh, is a way of indirectly subsidizing small business. Uh, but you could even use the revenue generated by taxes on big business uh, in order to offer an actual subsidy to small businesses. Uh, right now, Walmart and Amazon get massive subsidies from local governments when they build new stores and distribution centers. The government should actually be taxing Walmart and Amazon more heavily and subsidizing local and small businesses instead. In order to encourage widespread distribution of ownership, you could create tax incentives for worker-owned cooperatives. For instance, you could exempt worker-owned cooperatives from corporate taxes. You could even tax non-cooperative enterprises more heavily in order to encourage them to switch their organizational model. Some enterprises do need to be done on a large scale and on a collective basis. Ideally, such enterprises ought to be organized along cooperative lines where the workers earn dividends as a share of company profits either in addition to or in place of ordinary wages. As I have already mentioned, the introduction of landed property under feudalism allowed individuals to earn income simply by owning land and resources and charging others for access. This allowed landlords to confiscate a portion of wealth from productive laborers without actually having to do any productive labor themselves. This is the root cause of inequality in the modern world. The classical liberals like Adam Smith and John Locke and the American founding fathers like Thomas Paine and Thomas Jefferson proposed a land value tax as the best way of fixing this problem. The distributist theorist John Madai has also supported this policy. The land value tax proposal levies a tax against land values, but it excludes the value of any structure or improvement contributed by the owner. This differs from a property tax because a land value tax doesn't tax your house or anything else you build upon the land. Those are the products of your own labor and ought not to be taxed. However, land is a gift from God rather than a product created by human labor, so no one has a natural right to monopolize land and use it to, gen to generate personal profit via rent at the expense of the rest of mankind. The land value tax confiscates a portion of unearned income that results from increases in land value and redistributes it to the rest of society 
that has been excluded from the use of that land. The land value tax basically means that we all owe rent to society rather than to a private landlord. The person who owns a gold mine will pay the highest tax, while the person simply living on a couple acres of land uh, will pay very little tax. And this is perfectly fair because the person who owns a gold mine gets the special privilege of exploiting natural resources for private profit. The gold mine isn't a product of the landowner's labor. It is a natural resource that ought to belong to everyone. Now, the revenue from the land value tax can be used to fund a citizen's dividend, giving everyone a dividend as a share of the rent collected by society, or it can be used to fund public projects uh, that benefit everyone. Following Catholic social teachings, the distributist distinguishes between interest earned for lending as an investment and usury or interest charged uh, on consumer credit. A person who lends for productive purposes is rightly due an increased return because his money has helped the borrower make money. The lender who lends for consumption rather than production is not rightly due an increased return uh, because he did not actually invest in any productive activity. In his book, Towards a Truly Free Market, John Madai writes the following, and I quote, Here we must distinguish between lending for investment and usury. Investment means giving money to firms and entrepreneurs in order to expand production and increase the wealth of society. In this case, interest is merely the investor's participation in the profits. It is the wage of the capital supplied. And the one who supplies it is, it is entitled in justice to the wage. Usury, on the other hand, is lending at interest to increase consumption. Nothing is added to the wealth of society, however much may be added to the wealth of the lender. Since nothing is produced, there is no valid claim to profit. Interest payments, in this case, merely constitute a transfer of wealth from the borrower to the lender, but no net increase in the social stock of wealth. In fact, wealth is actually used up in this process without making a contribution to production, hence the name usury." End quote. This analysis is based mostly on the teachings of St. Thomas Aquinas, but it should be noted that the Bible condemns usury in Leviticus uh, and elsewhere, and also that the early church fathers unanimously condemned the practice of usury. Given that usury is non-productive, uh, and just ends up uh, using up wealth and happens to be harmful to society, uh, it would make sense to either ban usury or to impose a high tax on income earned through usury. Uh, perhaps the best solution would be to impose a differential tax on usurious income, uh, so that the tax effectively prohibits too much usury. Distributism would create an ownership economy, where private property is the norm, where wealth is distributed in a fairly egalitarian manner, where many smaller local businesses would produce and compete uh, rather than having a few large national and international corporations dominating the marketplace. Uh, Family-owned businesses and mom-and-pop shops would thrive and uh, do well once again, uh, poverty and crime would not be a systemic issue, but rather a relatively rare occurrence, and this is the direction in which we need to be moving. If you're interested in the topic of distributism at all, uh, I'd like to recommend some books. Uh, the first is An Essay on the Restoration of Property by Hilaire Belloc. The second is The Servile State, also by Hilaire Belloc. The um, third is Utopia of Usurers by G.K. Chesterton, and the fourth is uh, Towards a Truly Free Market by John Madai. Uh, 